the words to which I would like to draw your attention to are to be found in the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 4, from verse 1 to 22. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, were there, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Well, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. We pray that as we hear your word, you may deliver us from unbelief and disobedience. Produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, who doesn't want to be liked? There's something in each of us which is after people's acceptance, people's approval, and to be well thought of. And as Christians, whether in the workplace or amongst our friends and family, we want to come across as credible people. There's this real desire to be relevant and to be in touch with the social issues of the day. We'll take the recent Black Lives Matter movement in light of George Floyd's death. Are they rightly call out racism, injustice and inequality, uh, which we as Christians also oppose as a real and live issue? But there's a fine line for us in speaking out against racism and doing so in a way which seeks to impress the movement to gain people's approval and respect. Now that's very dangerous, this desire for the approval of society. Uh, we need to watch that. Because as we'll see in today's passage, 
The Christian stands for certain truths, truths concerning Jesus, uh, which I believe the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements in the world would certainly oppose. But this isn't to say that being a Christian is always to be a marginalised and oppressed people, uh, that we always start on the back foot as it were. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the first believers were said to be enjoying the favour of all the people. So there's something attractive about a person who follows Jesus. When the world gets to know a Christian better, they realise that they're not characterised by hate, but of love, kindness, truth and integrity, generosity. Christians were, in fact, winsome people. But as we come to our passage for today, we begin to see the first real signs of opposition, of persecution. The Apostle Peter had just healed a man who was lame from birth. He never walked. And just like at Pentecost, uh, with the outpouring of the Spirit, Peter explains that Jesus is the one behind what they've just witnessed. God has glorified his servant Jesus. The healing accomplished in Jesus' name testifies to that fact. Jesus, whom the people killed, God raised from the dead. He's God's appointed Messiah. Well, now hearing this being preached and taught rubbed the temple authorities the wrong way. Because look with me at chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. What these temple authorities were disturbed by uh, is the fact that these apostles were teaching the people. Because up to this point, the role of teaching people in the temple belonged to them, the temple authorities. So how dare these apostles, these untrained, unschooled men, usurp that role? Well, more than that, in their eyes, they were proclaiming a disturbing message about the man Jesus rising from the dead. And because he did, how this guarantees that there will be a general resurrection to come when God will restore all things. The Sadducees in particular didn't like this message. They took offence to that message as they didn't believe in, in a general resurrection or life after death. Others belonging to the Pharisaic party did affirm the resurrection, but would take offence that this should be found through Jesus, the very person who had repeatedly denounced their teachings and practices. So these temple authorities, they took action. In verse 3, they seized Peter and John and put them in jail. Well, that would make them think twice about teaching people about Jesus again, wouldn't it? Well, as we consider how the apostles were opposed, uh, increasingly, uh, this is our experience today as well. Society no longer considers us Christians out of touch, quaint, old-fashioned, and therefore to be ignored, people to be brushed aside. But instead, we're increasingly considered as offensive, even harmful, people to be silenced because we affirm the Bible's teachings about marriage, abortion, and gender identity. And it's easy for us to feel overwhelmed by the current situation, uh, because it's uh, really complex. Uh, we are tempted not to say anything, ashamed of our Christian identity and beliefs, tempted to doubt that the gospel, uh, the gospel of Jesus is actually good news. Well, look with me at verse 4. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Well, do we not need to hear this at this time? To be reminded and encouraged by verse 4. 
You and I may be opposed, mocked, ridiculed, perhaps reprimanded for speaking about Jesus. But when it comes to the gospel, it's a totally different matter. Nothing can bind it. The gospel can't be chained or shackled. The gospel goes out with the result that many do believe it and are added to God's church. It was back then as it is today. The gospel isn't outdated. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe. Well, we, we see that the temple authorities can put Peter and John in jail, but they can't stop the gospel from establishing faith in Christ. Well, now, J Peter and John, uh, they've spent the night in jail. And that's a big deal if you think about it. Uh, it's the first time that the apostles were put in custody for telling others about Jesus. We're left to wonder, did they sleep? How did they process what had just happened to them? How would the apostles respond? Well, on the next day, uh, the big wigs of the Jewish council assembled together. Notably in verse 6, Annas the high priest and Caiaphas were present. Then look with me at verse 7. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Well, here the apostles are very much put on trial. They're standing before the very people, the very court that tried and condemned Jesus. Jesus himself on one occasion was also put under this very form of questioning. Back in Luke 20, verse 2. There they said, Tell us by what authority you are doing these things. They said to Jesus, Who gave you this authority? And so here in Acts 4, the trial of Jesus is effectively reopened as evidence about Jesus is once again brought before these temple authorities and also before us as readers to examine. By what power or what name did you do this? The temple authorities asked Peter and John. And we can't imagine how much pressure the apostles must be under at this time. Peter himself had denied Jesus three times when Jesus was put on trial. So will he recant? Will he renounce Jesus to save his own skin? Well, look with me at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter doesn't hold back from testifying to the risen Lord Jesus. He doesn't water things down. He begins by speaking about the healing of the lame man as an act of kindness. And why should anyone be put on trial for that? But then Peter moves on to speak of the source of the healing, how this man was healed. Peter attributes it to the same Lord Jesus whom they crucified, but God raised from the dead. The very person and name they opposed is the one central to God's saving purposes. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the key figure in God's plan to restore a people to himself and to restore all of creation. 
What we see in the healing of the lame man, his physical restoration, is a foretaste of the new creation to come, when all things will be fully restored. Or more than that, the healing of the lame man acts as a sign. It points us to Jesus' present power and authority to save in the ultimate sense. Besides all the vitamins and nutrient supplement ads out there would have you believe, physical healing, physical well-being in this life, yes, it's important, but isn't the be-all and end-all. Because what we all need, whatever our skin colour, whatever our age or socioeconomic background, is the salvation that Jesus alone offers, the forgiveness of sins, the hope of glory. Well, that's Peter's punchline. That's his main point. Well, because look with me again at verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so don't stop at physical healing. Don't even stop at the fact that it was Jesus who healed the man. Move on, move on to consider the significance of the healing, what it actually points us to. The authority and power of Jesus alone, his universal authority to save us from our sins, to save us from God's coming judgment. Is there anything more important than your eternity? Is there anything more important than being in a right relationship with God right now? Well, the good news is Jesus has taken care of it. So today, if you haven't already, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him, believe in him, turn to the one who was crucified, but God raised from the dead and you'll be saved. We'll be unsure of the salvation that Jesus brings. Can I encourage you to get in touch with us? Perhaps leave a comment below. Well, for a brief moment, we forgot that this glorious message of salvation through Jesus was actually proclaimed before a hostile audience. Well, how did the temple authorities respond? Were they cut to the heart uh, hearing Peter's message as were the Acts 2 crowd? Did they call on the name of Jesus? Well, what we see unfold is a contrast between the leadership of the apostles with the leadership of these temple authorities. The temple authorities, they were taken aback by Peter's reply. They saw the apostles' courage and their boldness. They realised that these apostles were untrained when it comes to interpreting scripture. And they took note that they had been with Jesus, whom they despised. And what's more, the healed man was literally standing there with them. That a clear healing miracle had just happened was undeniable, irrefutable. Yet despite what they've just witnessed, the temple authorities were filled with unbelief. Well, look with me at verse 16. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Well, we've all heard of the phrase, seeing is believing. But is that true when it comes to believing in Jesus? If only Jesus appears before my eyes, my very eyes, or performs a miracle on my terms, then I'll believe. Uh, this is something that we've all heard people say. But will they? Will they believe? Well, here we see that seeing doesn't lead to believing. Seeing can't lead to believing. 
the miracle, miraculous healing and Peter's faithful explanation couldn't persuade these temple authorities to faith. They've seen a sign and heard the word, yet their hearts remained unmoved. It will take more than seeing and persuasive words to move someone from unbelief to belief. To these temple authorities, the apostles' message remained offensive. It didn't agree with their teaching. And seeing thousands hear that message and come to believe in Jesus was a clear threat to their leadership. So they had to do something about it. And they commanded the apostles not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And so examination moves to suppression. The heat on the apostles intensifies. Will they crack under pressure, under human authority to not speak about Christ? Well, look with me at verse 19. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now that's courage, but no ordinary courage to defy human authorities when their demands go against obedience to God. The apostles' courage comes from having been transformed by the gospel, the message of the risen Christ, whom they've seen and heard. And having received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they can't stop speaking about Jesus. Not even the temple authorities can stop them. And what's more remarkable is the fact that these men once denied Jesus. And in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of these authorities, they're nothing. Unschooled, ordinary men, fishermen with no scholarly credentials. Yet Jesus uses them to be his witnesses. He works powerfully through them to proclaim a message of salvation in his name. And so the courage is all from God. The power is in the message. And this is all the more apparent when we see the powerlessness and fear of these temple authorities. Verse 21. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Do we not admire the apostles' freedom in defying the temple authorities, the courage they displayed? Well, all too often, we're ashamed of Christ uh, and we, we, we do not take the opportunities to speak about him. We lack power. We lack conviction. But if we've truly heard and believed the message of the risen Christ, then we're changed forever. Having found salvation through Christ, forgiven by him, given the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and transform us, we will not think to depart from this message, to major on social justice, the environment or something else. We will not think to defy God before others. We can't stop talking about Christ because we want others to know him as well. No, we will keep speaking about Christ, teaching about Christ, even in the face of opposition. Why? Because the gospel is the message for our time, a timeless message. It's what everybody needs to hear. Because salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Well, let me, let me close our time in prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that through Jesus, we have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we consider the apostles teaching about him, fill our hearts with joy in believing and enable us by your spirit to keep speaking about Christ to others. To the glory of your name. Amen.